Critics have condemned the band as a Pearl Jam knockoff. They call Creed the choir boys of Christian rock. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA. And today we are here to tell the story of Creed. And it's a very interesting one because on the one hand, they were one of, if not the single fastest rising bands of the 90s, going from a local band to triple platinum status in less than two years. But on the other hand, at the same time that they were experiencing all that success, they were also easily the most hated band of the late 90s and early 2000s. Really like the Nickelback, or MGK of their time. They were like the go-to punchline for every smug music snob or critics jokes. And on the surface, it's easy to see why they were such a target. There are Florida butt rock bands with those yarling vocals. They had somewhat heavy handed Christian lyrics and their vocalist Scott Stapp, to put it bluntly, definitely came off like a douche. In fact, I would say that Scott's behavior was by far the single most important factor in their downfall. But as easy as it would be for me to make a video just dunking on Creed and laughing at all the crazy stuff that Scott did, like going on TV and telling Dave Grohl that he has a small penis, or making a sex tape with Kid Rock, and yes, both of those things did happen, as easy as it would be to do that, I just can't. Because the truth is that there's a lot more to the story than most people realize. And all of that is exactly what I will explain in this video. But first, if you haven't, please check me out on Twitch. I'm streaming twice a week from 4 to 7 p.m. Pacific on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And there's a link to that in the description of this video. And also, I want to thank Clocks and Colors for sponsoring this video. They make super high quality jewelry and apparel. For example, they sent me this gangplank bracelet, this high noon necklace and this desert wanderer hat and you can tell just from holding it like just from the weight how high quality and well made this stuff really is and they are doing a giveaway just for viewers of my channel all you need to do is comment on this video and subscribe to their mailing list using the link in the description of this video everybody who enters will get a $40 gift card by email and they will also pick one winner from the list of people who subscribed and provide that winner with a $500 gift card. They'll notify the winner within one week of this video going live. So now is the time to enter. So check that out. And thanks again to Clocks and Colors for sponsoring this video. The band started in 1994 when Scott Stapp connected with Creed's future guitarist, Mark Tremonti, when they were both students at Florida State University. As Scott tells it in his book, I went to his place where we sat in a little room with a mattress and pillows everywhere. Both of us had acoustic guitars and we just started playing together. I sang some lyrics that came out of nowhere and suddenly we felt something. It was musical love at first sight. But in order to really understand the band and their story, you really have to understand Scott Stapp. Scott was born under the name Anthony Scott Flippin in Orlando, Florida. And he had a relatively normal early childhood until his father suddenly abandoned the family when he was five years old. One day they were watching TV and then his dad just got up and never came back. That was it. And this left his mother struggling to raise Scott and his two sisters alone. She had a job at J.C. Penney where she really just couldn't even make ends meet. So they grew up on welfare and food stamps, which was tough enough, but it got even worse. A couple years later, his mother remarried, this time to a man named Steve Stapp, who was a dentist, who was also extremely religious and very, very abusive to Scott and the family. I was beaten. Then it got sicker when religion was brought into it and he began to beat us in the name of God. And beyond being just a religious nut job, he just sounds like an incredibly cruel person. According to Scott, at one point years earlier, he told me that my baby teeth weren't falling out properly and that he'd have to extract 10 of them all in one sitting. I wanted to ask whether that was necessary, but who was I to question a man who was both my father and a successful dentist? The process was excruciatingly painful. So he got abandoned by his birth father and adopted by this incredibly cruel, awful stepfather, all of this before he was even a teenager. And imagine what that does to a child. 
And so Scott eventually had enough and ran away from home in high school. And honestly, who can blame him? But still, Scott remained a devout Christian whose belief in God never wavered despite all the abuse that he had endured. And that was the foundation of Creed. It was the combination of Mark's guitar and songwriting abilities, coupled with Scott's vocals and lyrics, most of which revolved around him struggling to work through all these issues that he was dealing with. And the way that he worked through those issues was largely through his belief as a Christian. But it's important to note that he was really the only quote unquote Christian in the band and that they certainly never intended to be a Christian band at all. Believe me, if any of the other guys thought that I had God in mind when the name Creed came up, they would have shut it down and I would have too. We didn't have the slightest intention of introducing anything spiritual into our music. Our ambition was to be a big time rock band like Def Leppard or Metallica. And the band immediately started playing shows pretty much wherever they could around Tallahassee, at local college bars and clubs. And within a couple years, they had built up a really solid local following. And so they decided that the next step for them was to record an album. They got a loan from their bassist Brian's father for $6,000, which they used to record and release their first album, My Own Prison, on their own label, which they called Blue Collar Records. And sonically, it fit in pretty nicely with the emerging post-grunge scene with bands like Bush, Candlebox, Silverchair, and Collective Soul. And honestly, for what was essentially a local band at the time, it's pretty damn good. They hustled it around town and got local record stores to take it on consignment and sold all 5,000 copies in a month. They were also selling out local shows, sometimes drawing crowds in the thousands and getting radio airplay all over Florida and some other parts of the South. They were making waves as an unsigned band and the industry was noticing. The major labels started courting them. And although Sony, Warner, Atlantic, and RCA all said that they wanted to sign the band, ultimately only one actually made an offer, which was a brand new label called Wind Up Records. Wind Up was founded by a guy named Alan Meltzer, who had gotten rich from starting a company called CD One Stop, which was a wholesale CD distributor. But what he really wanted was to be like a big time record executive. And so he took the money that he'd made from his business, started a label, and Creed was the label's first signing at the suggestion of his wife, Diane, who was handling all the A&R. Wind Up gave them a $50,000 advance to remix and re-release My Own Prison on Wind Up. And thanks to Alan's connections with distribution and radio, they were able to get Creed in front of a national audience. And to say that that promotional strategy worked would be a massive understatement. By August of 1998, almost exactly one year after its release, it was certified double platinum. And just to give you an idea of how far they came in such a short period of time, the first time they played New York City in 1997, they played to a few dozen people in a bar. And a year later, they came back, but this time they were playing Madison Square Garden opening for Van Halen. As Scott put it, in less than two years, we'd gone from being broke stoner rockers wearing flip-flops to four guys worth millions with hundreds of thousands coming in every day. It was an incredible success story. But as much as fans loved Creed, critics hated them. This review of My Own Prison is pretty representative of how most people talked about it. Creed is essentially Alice in Chains without the bite. It's dripping Seattle's best coffee right down to vocalist Scott Stapp's shameless Lane Staley-like moans on the opening track Torn and the woeful attempt at melodrama on Pity for a Dime. And guitarist Mark Tremonti is no Jerry Cantrell, not that he tries. Just as the warrants and slaughters of the world hung around long after their brand of music had gone to the grave, so will Creed. Let's move on folks. And although they didn't see themselves as a Christian band, a lot of other people were starting to mostly because of Scott's lyrics, which did deal a lot with his faith. Instead of My Own Prison, this first album could have been called Twisted Faith because so many of the themes revolved around my struggle between the false faith of my childhood and the journey that I was on towards true faith. Especially if you look at some specific lines, for example, this one from the song In America. Holy in America, we kill the unborn. 
I don't know if he actually meant that in like a pro-life context, but given all the Christian material in their other songs, it certainly comes off that way. The album would end up spending 110 weeks on the Billboard Top 200. They won Rock Artist of the Year at the Billboard Awards. And with that, they were essentially the biggest new band in rock. But even with all that success, the band didn't rest. They toured nonstop for years, only slowing down to record their second album, Human Clay, which came out in 1999. The first single from the album was Higher. which was a massive hit right out of the gate. It beat out Metallica to spend a record-breaking 17 weeks at number one on the rock charts. But their next single, Arms Wide Open, which was about the birth of Scott's first child, was what truly made them into just absolutely massive stars that transcended the genre of just rock. It went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100 and won a Grammy for Best Rock Song. And on the back of all that, the album debuted at number one and sold over 10 million copies over the next two years. They were one of the biggest artists on the planet in any genre. And as far as I'm aware, no rock artist has had that much success since Creed. But it wasn't all good. For one, Scott was starting to really struggle with the pressures of fame and constant touring. He'd been partying to some extent since college, but it was starting to turn into something much more serious. I had started looking for ways to cope. When I smoked pot on occasion, my fantasies intensified. At times, my drinking led to blackouts, an obvious danger sign. Had I been sober on a continual basis, I might have recognized the signs that had been there since I was a child. I was struggling with serious depression. And on top of that, the critics still were not kind to Creed. For example, the LA Times gave Human Clay two stars and said, like Krispy Kreme donuts, Creed has concocted a winning formula and dares not deviate from it, lest it result in lost market share. One of the most common criticisms of the band was that they were preachy. In particular, that people felt like Scott was forcing Christianity on their audience. For example, Rolling Stone said, he just loves conversion narratives. If you keep seeking, you will find, he sings in Are You ready with the conviction of one who feels he has made his important discoveries. And so although they had always insisted that they weren't a Christian band, they were increasingly seen as one and not just that, but as a self-righteous preachy band that forced their beliefs on their audience. However, I'm not sure that was entirely accurate. I think that their lyrics are more about Scott struggling to be the person that he wanted to be or felt like he should be, more so than trying to tell other people what to do. It really felt like he was talking to himself more than anything else. As he put it in his book, I could ask questions and not have answers. I could reveal my struggles. I could write about my prayers. The music only required that I be true to what I was feeling, and I was feeling God in the music no matter how severe my sin. The music kept me in constant conversation with God. For all my doubts and struggles, it was an honest conversation, and it still is. But with that said, he definitely didn't do himself many favors in terms of fighting that image. Oftentimes, coming off like he had a bit of a savior complex, like in the video for Arms Wide Open, when he stands standing on there with that rock with his arms held out like he's Jesus on the cross. There's also a pretty heavy handed visual metaphor for baptism in that video. So if he didn't want people to think that they were a Christian band, well, he didn't do a very good job of communicating that. And he also admits that his ego was getting out of control. After a show where we were received like conquering heroes, my ego went on overdrive. The key to spiritual equanimity is to give God the glory, but I retained a lot of that glory for myself. I didn't want to be who I was becoming, and yet I did. And so all of this was starting to create some serious tension within the band. While his ego was getting bigger and bigger, the rest of the band justifiably felt like he was getting an unfair share of the media attention. For example, when Rolling Stone put Creed on the cover of the magazine, they initially only wanted Scott until their management forced the magazine to put the entire band in the photo shoot. And because Scott was the mouthpiece for the band, they were also starting to resent that he was giving the band this image of an uncool Christian band. And I actually have a huge problem with that, but I will talk about that later. And so after the release of this album, the band was still on top of the world, but it was starting to crumble. Things eventually came to a head with the release of their third album, Weathered, which came out in 2001. That album also debuted at number one on Billboard and was a huge success, but behind the scenes, the band was starting to just really fall apart, mostly because of Scott. 
He continued to use drugs and alcohol to self-medicate his underlying depression that stemmed from all the abuse he went through as a child. And that was further exacerbated by his doctors prescribing things like prednisone, which is a steroid that can also cause insomnia and psychosis. And in addition to whatever was going on behind the scenes with the band, he also had several public incidents, most notably an especially bad show in 2002 that was so awful that the fans actually sued them for it, and his infamous appearance on a TV poker tournament. You have all the groupies, all the groupies you want? Don't you just like do whatever you want? Do you have like five of them after the show? What do you yeah. Do you? yeah, yeah, I have like five of them. Do you have a guy like going in the audience picking them out like this? Yeah, 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 I have like five of them in the audience. And so it all came to a head in 2004 when the band broke up because they just could not get along with Scott. When Creed broke up, we were we were doing very well and it was hard to kind of make that decision of being like, is it worth this feeling like this every day? You know, is it worth being uncomfortable? You know, and it wasn't. But although Creed was done, the rest of the band continued on without him, forming a new band called Alter Bridge with Miles Kennedy replacing him on vocals, who still do very well headlining tons of festivals and stuff to this day. Mark Tremonti also started a solo project called Tremonti, which shows off his metal side a little more. And Scott stayed busy as well. He released a solo album, which pretty much sounds like Creed. But Scott also continued to slide further into drugs and depression with several incidents in the mid 2000s, like a DUI, getting into a fight with two of the guys in 311 and the sex tape with Kid Rock and ultimately a suicide attempt in 2006 where he jumped off a hotel balcony and would have died if he wasn't saved by the rapper T.I. of all people. But despite all of that, the band did get back together in 2009 for one album and some touring before breaking up again in 2012 because of Scott's issues, which unfortunately had only gotten worse. And in 2014, he had a very serious public psychotic breakdown. He said that he was abusing prescription medication and was paranoid. My guess is that means Adderall or maybe he was just doing straight up meth. I don't know, but it was bad. Stapp made headlines after posting these disturbing videos to Facebook, followed by a series of distressing 911 calls. I've uncovered that the core of ISIS is within my own family. And things were not looking good for Scott. The next step after this kind of thing is usually jail or maybe even worse. But fortunately, he was able to get help. His wife gave him an ultimatum that either you have to get help or I'm out and I'm taking the kids. And to his credit, he did get help. He went into rehab, and from what I can see, he's been doing very well ever since. He most recently put out a solo album in 2019 that has a song called Purpose for Pain, which very directly addresses all of it. And the rest of the guys in the band continue to do well with Alter Bridge. So as far as I can tell, everybody in the band is in a good place now, which is really cool to see. But that is not all there is to the story. The first thing that should be obvious is that yes, Scott Stapp was an arrogant, out of control asshole. There is no two ways about that. Even he admits it. But it should also be obvious why he was like that. This is somebody who endured trauma on top of trauma as a child, first abandoned by his birth father, and then physically and emotionally abused by his new stepfather. He's also part native, which genetically predisposes him to alcoholism. In a lot of ways, he kind of reminds me of my mom, who was also an incredibly difficult to handle out of control alcoholic. And I know why, because both her parents died before she was 15 and then her brother killed himself when she was 20. Of course she was a mess, who wouldn't be? And so my point is, when you see someone struggling with addiction and mental health as he so clearly was, instead of pointing and laughing at them like so many people did with Scott Stapp, take a step back and ask yourself, why? Why are they doing this? What did they go through that could have caused them to be so dysfunctional? I think a little compassion goes a long way, and who knows, you might actually change someone's life. And secondly, aside from Scott's behavior, the reasons why people hated the band were mostly really shallow. Hating a band for being Christian is honestly just ignorant. 
Like imagine mocking a band for being Muslim. Hopefully you would never do that. So why is it any different if they're Christian? The media has always been kind of biased against Christians. And I think it sucks, even though I personally am not a Christian myself. And hating a band just because they're popular? I mean, come on, that is honestly just childish. And all of us should be better than that. So ultimately, whether you like Creed's music or not, I think there's a lot that all of us can learn from their story in terms of empathy and compassion. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Also, I want to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get all my podcasts early. I also do giveaways. And if you want me to review your music or art or anything else, all you got to do is join at the $10 and up level. Every month I do a call for submissions. If you want me to review something live on Twitch, just drop it in the comments of that post. Then I will review it live on Twitch and post it on Patreon for everyone to see. So if that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I will sign off for now, but I will see you next time.